Hello. Happy Valentine's Day to all of you. I am Charity Emerunye Swift of St. Luke's Church. We have a video for you. With this video, we want to send a message of love to all of you who are suffering because of the pandemic. Please donate to the Coronavirus Fund for South Fairfax County to help local communities that have been hard hit by the pandemic. Thank you very much. Hey, Tom, it's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, but tell me, why are you in a box? You're in a box too. Wow, you're right. You know, I've noticed a whole lot of people are in boxes these days. Well, you know why? It's COVID-19. People don't want to get sick and maybe die by being exposed to folks face to face. Well, that reminds me, we have a telethon to do, just like Pledge Week. Are operators standing by? Well, it's not that kind of telethon with lots of ringing phones. Well, then how are people going to give money for COVID relief along the Route 1 corridor? You know, lots of our neighbors are suffering. Well, we could use this QR code to make it easy to make a donation. All folks have to do is point their smartphones at the image and they'll go right to our donation page. Yeah, and then folks just need to click on Community Outreach and then on the memo line, COVID Relief. That way their donations will go straight into our COVID Relief Fund with all proceeds being divided between Rising Hope Mission Church, Alice's Kids, and Neighborhood Health for local efforts to help our neighbors in need along Richmond Highway. Also, Folks can do the old fashioned thing by mailing a check to St. Luke's Episcopal Church, 8009 Fort Hunt Road, Alexandria, Virginia, 22308. Please write COVID relief on the memo line so that your money goes to that special fund. Is that St. Luke's Episcopal Church at 8009 Fort Hunt Road, Alexandria, 22308? Wow, that is easy. But Tom, I miss all those ringing telephones. Oh, well, technology marches on. We will repeat the QR code throughout this video so that folks have plenty of opportunities to give. Good deal. Now on with the show. Bring on the dancing girls. Dancing girls, cool.
Hello, my name is Rodney Lusk and I'm the Lee District Supervisor and I'm here to tell you why Valentine's Day is so important to me. Um, last year we were very fortunate to have one of our local companies um, make a very significant contribution on Valentine's Day. He committed to provide 30,000 eggs to our uh, broader community and specifically to those in the Richmond Highway Quarter. We partnered with United Community to help distribute those eggs and I'll say uh, when you see 30,000 eggs uh, you think that's a lot of eggs and we ended up uh, handing out pretty much all of those eggs um, during the session that we had on um, February 14th. So again, uh, Deloon Corp uh, was the sponsor of that event. Um, they've also been pivotal in helping us with our food distribution program, which we've been running since uh, May of uh, this uh, past year. We've been able to provide uh, food for over 38,000 families, and we've been able to provide over a million pounds of food. What's important here is that Deloon applied for a USDA contract they won that contract. They were the only vendor in the Commonwealth of Virginia to be able to do that. And what is significant is they were able to provide a significant amount of that food to our neighbors here uh, in the Mount Vernon and Lee areas. The South County Government Center was a place that we hosted many of those uh, distributions. And again, um, it's so important that we do things to support those who've been adversely impacted by COVID. COVID-19 has had a tremendous impact in our community. When we think about a number of the conditions uh, for those who live along the Richmond Highway corridor, they've had significant issues um, over time. But as we moved into COVID-19, we've seen the major impacts in terms of loss of jobs, um, food insecurity, difficulty paying rent, difficulty um, paying any other expenses. It has been devastating for those who are Hispanic and African American as we look at the county overall. We have been um, focused on doing everything we can to alleviate some of that pain. And it is so important that the neighbors in our community step up because we know that there's a need for food in all of our food pantries, our food banks. Um, many of them cannot provide the level of food that is needed by the residents in this area. Specifically, uh, when we've done our food distributions, we've noticed that we have car lines in excess mile and a half, two miles in length. We have not been able to provide food to every person in those car lines. It's difficult when we get to the end of the line and we run out of, excuse me, it's difficult when we get to the end of our food distribution and we have cars that are still waiting to pick up food. Um, you, as a person in the community can make a difference. You can help um, providing a donation, helping those food banks, helping those ecumenical groups with funding is gonna be pivotal and important to making sure we address this food insecurity in our community. Thank you.
Richard and Richard. We're doing some Vic Hop pork butts. We got about, uh, what do we got? About 100 pound of pork butts here. We're cooking up on, what's the day? Tuesday the 2nd of February for dinner at Vic Hop on Wednesday the 3rd of February. So we got them all unpacked and we got them rubbed. We do rub our butts here. And what's your rub? Well, what we're using today is Billy Bones Barbecue Original Rub. Okay. Like candy on a bone. Uh-huh. Smells good. Yes, sir. So I fired up the smoker, oh, I don't know, about an hour, hour and a half ago. I will tell you it's about 30 degree outside with wind blowing. So I wanted to get it fired up and get it heated up. So it's getting ready out there. We put the rub on. We'll let these sit and soak for a while. And then we'll load them up on the grill. And uh, what are we uh, smoking them at? What temperature tonight? I'm going to shoot for about 250 for 250. 12 hours. And what type of wood are we using? We're using some wood we get from a purveyor over on Route 1 off of, off of uh, behind the old Mount Vernon High School. He's a good supplier of uh, firewood for us. He hand picks, hand selects, hand chops, and sends it to us. And uh, his name will remain anonymous? Well, that's up to him. Yeah, it'll be anonymous. Yeah. But he, he takes care of us. So about 12.20 uh, a.m., 3rd of uh, February. Butts are on the smoker. Ready to go. It's 9.30 on Wednesday, February 3rd. Got these butts smoking at about 250 degrees. Got some pretty good smoke coming out of the smokestack. Butts in the back of the smoker where it's hottest, 187 degrees. The middle of the smoker, 172. And the front of the smoker, 174 degrees. We'll smoke these butts to 200, 204 degrees until they probe real smoothly. We'll pull them off, put them in a cooler for a couple of hours, and then pull them and take them up to Vic Cop tonight for dinner. So we're here. Uh, Wednesday night, we smoked these butts. We put them on about midnight last night. Smoked them all night long, took them off. That's on this afternoon. And a pork butt comes from, uh, we took them off the smoker, first of all. We double wrapped them in heavy duty aluminum foil. Put them in a paper bag, put them in a cooler. And, there, and this is hot been off the smoker for a couple of hours. A pork butt is, um, this thing's just falling apart. The pork butt is um, really off of the shoulder, part of the shoulder of the, uh, of the pig. It's not really the butt. The butt is a uh, ham. Yeah, but it, the, the, the story is that it was named a pork butt. Look at this. Uh, come in here, Richard, a little closer. See the bark and mm -hmm. the smoke ring of this uh, just falling apart in my hand, so this is perfectly done. Nice and juicy. Nice and juicy. The, uh, the story is that it, it became named a pork butt because um, when it was originally being shipped, it was um, being shipped in wooden barrels that were called butts by the, uh, the shipping companies. And so that, that's the story. I don't know anything different from that. So this black on the outside, one would think that that's burned, but you can see that this is, this is what's called the bark. And we'll intermix it with the, with the uh, meat and that'll give it a great flavor. Look how it just falls apart yeah. in my hands. So, reminder, we rubbed these butts yesterday, Tuesday, before we uh, put them on the smoker. So that rub that's on that uh, butt is what's now the bark that Richard was just talking about. And so um, we're going to take this down to um, South County Government Center tonight, and we're going to feed um, unfortunate folks along the Route 1 corridor that are homeless. And uh, it's part of the hypothermia pro program. So... Uh, the goal being that no one dies from hypothermia during the winter months. And St. Luke's does this every Wednesday during the months of February and March. 
Yeah. Well, we don't do we don't smoke pork every Wednesday, no. but we we serve dinners down we there. Serve dinners for about fifty clients, and in years that were not, you know, COVID, we would have actually spent the night in a homeless shelter, um, uh, supervising these men and women who are uh, seeking shelter from the winter weather. So um, that's pork butt, y'all. There you go. One down, 10 to go. There you go. Great job. Hi, I'm Dawn, and today we are going to make raspberry ribbon pie. So this is a recipe that my mom and my grandma found in the 1970s, and they made it for Christmas that year, and it was a hit. So I wanted to share it with you. It's a very pretty pie. It has red and white layers, so it's great for Valentine's Day, for 4th of July, for Christmas, any time of the year that you want to serve it. So uh, let's get started. First, you're going to need a baked and cooled pie crust. Next, we're going to make two fillings. We're going to make a red raspberry filling and we're going to make a white uh, whipped cream and cream cheese filling. So let's get started on the red filling. You are going to take a quarter cup of sugar and three ounce package of raspberry jello. You're going to dissolve the jello and the sugar in a cup and a quarter of boiling water. So mix that together so that the jello and the, the sugar are completely dissolved. To that, you're going to add a teaspoon of lemon juice and you're going to add 10 ounces of frozen raspberries. This is a 12 ounce bag. I'm just gonna eyeball it. I'm just not gonna pour all of it in. So you want to stir this until the raspberries just begin to soften a little bit. Okay, so after that is combined, we're gonna pop it in the fridge. We need this to partially set. It'll take about 30 minutes to an hour. Next, we're gonna get started on the white layer. So I have a cup of cream that I've already whipped up. I have three, out, three ounces of cream cheese and in that I've mixed um, a third of a cup of powdered sugar and a teaspoon of vanilla, then I need to combine these two bowls. So I'm gonna do that by, I'm just, by adding just a little bit of the whipped cream into the cream cheese mixture. This will just thin it out a little bit and make it easier to fold into the whipped cream. So mix that gently. Now we're gonna fold this cream cheese into the whipped cream. Okay, I'm gonna finish that. We're gonna let the jello get partially set. And then when I come back, we're gonna assemble the pie. So we're going to start with half of the white mixture. We're gonna spread that on the bottom of the pie pan. Then we're going to spoon on half of the red. This is still, even after an hour, it's still kind of liquidy. So we'll have to be very careful when we put the white layer on top of it so that it doesn't um, disturb it. And for the white layer, uh, it's easier for me to put it in a piping bag and to put it on that way instead of um, spooning it on, but whatever works for you is fine. I feel like it's especially like this when the raspberry is still pretty liquidy. Try to get all those little holes, then it's going to spread very easily. And this is the spreader that I use. And then lastly, we're going to add one more red layer. And then we're going to pop it back in the fridge and let it continue to 
gets completely set. And then after that, I will show you how to decorate the cup. Okay, it's looking pretty. All right, back in the fridge. And lastly, I wanted to show you one way to decorate the top of the pie. You don't have to do this. It's completely optional, but I think it's pretty. Um, what I did was I printed a, a graphic, a piece of clip art that I liked and uh, printed that out, then put a piece of parchment paper on the top. And then I melted some vanilla bark and this is a candy making squeeze bottle. It's from Wilton. I probably got it at Michael's, but you can put it right in the microwave. And then I traced over, traced onto the parchment paper, the design that's underneath and let that cool. And then it's ready to go. Then I just need to carefully put that on top of the pie. Another thing that you could do is you can put dollops of whipped cream all around the edge of the pie and you can put fresh raspberries on the whipped cream if you want. But this is what I did. I hope you like it. And there you have it. Raspberry ribbon pie. Enjoy. Thank you. Thanks for watching. We are Judy and Jonathan Bryan and we have been married uh, 60 years this year. Hard to believe, uh, some, some went slowly, some went fast. And so we're here to tell you a little bit about our relationship. So we didn't have a whole lot of time together from the uh, beginning to date, seriously. And I was coming out of the Marine Corps, which was a time when I knew exactly how to make decisions. And, so I announced to Judy as we were engaged that um, there would be times when the 50-50 vote would really be a deadlock. And so I would make the decision if we had <laughs> <laughs> So we started off with that. And from there, it was all uphill or downhill or something because we just had to learn what it means to collaborate. And Judy has a wonderful story about uh, how she got into that. Well, when I was uh, an early teenager and beginning to think about, you know, boys and things, um, a boy who was a family friend and I were talking about marriage and I had lovely ideas of romance and floating off together as married couple to live happily ever after. And he said, I don't think it's that way. I think it's more like you get together and you put your shoulders together and you work in the same direction. And I thought, well, how dull is that? <laughs> but it turns out that was good advice. And I think that the teamwork part of it is, is really critical. And we had to learn that, uh, that aspect of it. Yeah, we had to learn a whole lot of stuff. And it took a long time to realize that it was collaboration that was making it work. Very far from the one side of decision making, it was working together uh, shoulder to shoulder. And so Judy was absolutely perfect in this because she understood how to um, work it out together and make do. I learned how to, listening is of course critical in any relationship, but you also learn to bite your tongue and keep your mouth shut, whether it's responding to something and say, you what, you're kidding me. Or just uh, saying, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and, and getting- Well, that's what that. all that meant. <laughs> Hi everyone, my name is Megan. Happy Valentine's Day and Happy New Year's. I'm gonna be talking us through how to make these Valentine's Day chocolate chip rollout cookies all decorated. Um, the first step is to make the cookie dough, of course. And to do that, we're going to start with one cup of butter softened and one cup of light or dark brown sugar packed, a half cup of white granulated sugar, Mix that all together so that it's all creamed and fluffy. Then as a, as a next step, it'll be two whole eggs, one tablespoon of vanilla extract, and again, mix that together so that it's fluffy. Separately, we're gonna mix the dry ingredients together, and that's 
three and a half cups of white uh, flour. When you're measuring out flour, make sure that you're not scooping the measuring cup directly out of the bag because it'll be too packed and you'll get too much flour. So instead, spoon it out of the bag into the measuring cup and into a bowl. So that's three and a half cups and one teaspoon of baking powder, dash of salt. Mix that together with a whisk or something so that it's all incorporated. And then we're going to gradually spoon the flour mixture into the mixing bowl with the wet ingredients gradually and mix that together so that it's nice and combined. Then as a last step, it's going to be one cup of mini semi-sweet chocolate chips and just mix that ever so gently with a, with a um, spatula or something so that you're not over mixing the mixture, but just enough to mix the chocolate chips evenly throughout. And that's your cookie dough. So next then you're going to roll that out um, onto the countertop and I've just floured the countertop a little bit so that your dough doesn't stick and that'll be uh, about a quarter inch thickness across the whole dough um, and just roll that out so that it's uh, nice and even a quarter inch is just maybe to the top of your fingertip or so if you put your finger down on the counter and then take your cookie cutters and I have two hearts here, um, a large one and a little one, just to shake things up. Of course, you can choose any shapes um, to, to um, fit the event or occasion. Um, and cut out your, your, um, your cookie dough here that you've rolled out. That'll go onto the prepared cookie sheet and into the oven at 375 degrees for about seven to nine minutes or until it's just a little bit golden brown around the edges. Pull that out of the oven and put on a cooling rack or something like this on the counter to cool so that you're not icing it hot. And then the icing. I've made a royal icing. Royal icing is nice because it hardens well um, and it's very easy. And that's just, it's one, one pound of confectioner sugar, three egg whites, a half teaspoon of cream of tartar, and just a little dash of salt. And mix that up so that it's nice and smooth. You can use an electric mixer or a whisk uh, or a spoon. And what I've done is separated that out so that I have half uh, pink, just with a little bit of red food coloring, and I left one half of it white. And then to ice them, you can use an icing spatula or a knife. Um, or what I've done is just to take a couple of regular old plastic bags, Ziploc bags, and spoon the icing into the bag and then cut a little corner off, um, just a very fine little tip so that you have, you have a little uh, frosting tip and then just curl your fingers, wrap your fingers around it, apply a little bit of pressure and you can ice them however you want, get the kids icing them, do red and white, mix them together, but you've got a real nice little chocolate chip Valentine's Day cookie there. Enjoy. Good morning, church family. Um, I thought I'd take a moment to record a song uh, that I wrote several years ago. It's called God's Country. And uh, the title may be a little misleading. Uh, the theme really has nothing to do with a particular physical place. It really has everything to do with uh, where we find ourselves uh, with God in a moment of prayer, which can, of course, be any place. So this is God's country. With each setting sun, there it was the dawn of heaven with blush. And I am always humbled by the magic in my maker's brush. Though the course of time is often drawn in desperate hues, every day his majesty remains to tell the news. God's country, wherever you go, he's waiting. This is God's country, whatever you need can be 
found here in God's country. Wherever you are, He is watching. Just close your eyes. In flight from old perspective, I can see your grand design. Face to face with a gentle grace, I am thankful for what's mine. These are gifts you've offered life beyond my own and more. So I will look ahead to all that lies behind your open door. God's country Wherever you go He is waiting This is God's country Whatever you need Can be found Here in God's country Wherever you are He is watching Just close your eyes And you're In His hands Though it's hard to Understand all the things he can do. Close your eyes and he'll be there with you. This is God's country. Wherever you go, he is waiting. This is God's country. Whatever you need can be found here in God's country. Wherever you are, he is watching. Just close your eyes See you next time. Um. We are the Stallmans, Tom and Marge. Uh, we've been married 65 years. And uh, a half. Well, <laughs> uh, marriage occurred in Phelps, New York, Western New York, in uh, June of 1955, after I graduated from the Naval Academy. But dialing way back to when we first met, uh, that was August of 1952. Uh, I was home on leave in Rochester, New York, my hometown, uh, on summer leave after my first year at the academy. And uh, my best high school buddy, Joe, he went to the Coast Guard Academy and he was home on summer leave too. And I got a, a note from him. I don't remember exactly how to come on over uh, today and we'll mess around. So I walked over to his house. We were in decent walking distance. And uh, so I walked in there and immediately, of course, I knew Joe. And also I recognized Betty, his high school and continuing girlfriend. But there was a, another uh, young lady in attendance that I didn't know. And it turned out to be Marjorie Fairman. Now, I was... Uh, you know, that was sort of a, a surprise blind date on me and foisted on me. So how did this come about? Well, there's a whole lot of stuff that came ahead of that that he wasn't aware of at the time. I was in nurses training with my friend Betty. And um, I said, boy, I would like to meet somebody really smart, smarter than I am. And uh, she said, I know just the guy, Tom Stolman. You'll probably marry him. So uh, it was a put up job that he was going to be at Joe's house when Betty and I went there. And there you have it. That's how we met. And we spent most of the rest of his leave 
uh, seeing each other every day, going uh, picnicking and wandering around and canoeing on the Genesee River and, and going Joe, out to dinner. Yeah, Joe and I both put on our white uniforms and took them to dinner one evening. So, uh, so that's how it got started. Well, and he had no idea. <laughs> Hello, friends. It's your friendly neighborhood priest, Father Nick. And I am absolutely delighted to be part of this fundraiser. So I'm not going to show you a talent because that would imply that I'm good at it. This is just something I really enjoy doing. And it's actually something that I learned about when I lived here in Alexandria when I was in seminary. So I'm going to teach you about the Gaelic sport called hurley. And hurley, even if you haven't heard of it, is actually the oldest continuously played sport in the world. It's actually over 2,000 years old and is played all over Ireland currently, and they are very, very fond of it there. And um, one interesting thing, something that draws me to it, is it's uh, a very humble sort of sport. You won't see names on jerseys. Numbers determine where you are in the field rather than uh, determining who the individual is. Um, and then no one's paid. If you want to play for County Cork, you have to live in County Cork and you have to have a day job. So they're all about humility and all about sportsmanship. It's a great sport. So first, let's go over our equipment. This is a hurley. It's a stick, I've got two of them. This is a traditional wooden one and you can see it's uh, gotten a lot of use and it's broken. So I bought this synthetic one so it won't break quite as easily. And then so the ball in hurley is called a schlitter. This is not a schlitter. This is our dog, Vanilla Bean's favorite toys, an oversized tennis ball. So, uh, but a Schlitter is about the size of a standard baseball, but where the crease is, the leather is folded out rather than in. So you have some creases to help the ball balance on the hurley. All right, and then something that's recent to the sport is you have to wear one of these helmets. It's like a lightweight lacrosse helmet. And it's got the cage on the front. And then because I'm wearing glasses, I'm not gonna wear it right now. Um, but these, this is pretty much standard issue. So when you're playing Hurley, there's 15 players on each team. So it's a lot of people on the field. It's called the fastest sport on grass. And then generally someone's only holding the Schlitter, the ball for a few seconds, but those few seconds are extremely intense. So in this video, I'm going to teach you some basic ground rules on how to get started in uh, playing Hurley. So here we go. Don't pick up the ball with your hand. Knock it into your hand with your stick. You can run with the ball while the ball is balancing on the flat of the blade. Look at me go. Nice hit. You can put the ball back in your hand, take four steps before continuing running. Good job, Nick. When you want to hit the Schlitter, keep your right hand on the bottom of the stick. Look at it go. Well, wasn't that fun? So Hurley is a fun game, and then there's a lot more rules. So the goal is an H-frame post, and then uh, if you get the ball over the post, that's one point. And if you get it below the post, that's called a score, which is worth three points. And yeah, it's a really fun game, and uh, if you ever want to play, uh, we can pass it around. All right, friends, God bless you, and I'll see you around church. Hello friends from St. Luke's. My name is Charlie Hazard. This is my boat Music Maker, a 31 foot sloop. And we're offering a four hour sale uh, to the largest donation for the St. Luke's coronavirus, uh, coronavirus relief fund. So if you're interested in spending four hours on the Potomac River uh, at a mutually agreed to date uh, in spring or summer, then please make a donation to a very worthy cause. And I'll be happy to take you out on the boat, four hours on the Potomac, teach you a little bit about sailing, and uh, enjoy the beauty of the Potomac. Uh, thank you so much for supporting uh, St. Luke's coronavirus relief effort. Really appreciate it. Buttermilk cheese biscuits. 
just right for a cold winter day, especially for something like Valentine's Day, which is a great little holiday to celebrate with wonderful food. My name is Suzanne Reynolds, and I'm a parishioner at St. Luke's Episcopal Church. And today we're going to learn to make buttermilk cheese biscuits, which are really pretty easy, and there's a lot of fun, and if you have a pent up aggressions, it's a great way to get out those pent up aggressions because you're gonna beat the tar out of the dough. Biscuits. The ingredients are fairly straightforward. It calls for uh, two and a half cups of, of self-rising flour, a half a cup of butter, which is like one stick, cold, and you want to cube that so that it's in small pieces when it's added, uh, one teaspoon of baking powder, one teaspoon of baking soda, and then approximately one half to three-fourths cups of grated sharp cheddar cheese. You can buy that already done if you want to, but I like to do it myself and approximately a cup and a half of chilled buttermilk. And the amount of buttermilk is really going to be determined by the humidity and the dryness all uh, within the flour and so forth. You may have to add a little bit more, it depends. You wanna make a, a sort of a soft dough. Some people like to actually get their hands in there and rub the dough, the flour and the butter between their fingers and kind of work it down into smaller pieces that way. I don't like to do that mainly because I don't want the dough to get heated. I want to keep it cold so that the butter doesn't really melt. This takes a little bit of elbow grease, but again, if you're getting tired of being at home with the pandemic, this is a good way to get some of that energy and some of that frustration out. And now I'm going to add the shredded cheese, the grated cheese, sharp cheddar. And now I'm going to add the buttermilk. You can buy this at almost any grocery store. And the amount of buttermilk you add really does depend on how dry it is and how quickly it gets assimilated in with the, the rest of the dry, with the dry ingredients. So now I'm turning this dough out onto my pastry cloth. I floured it pretty well because it is, as I said earlier, a soft dough, which translates to being a little sticky, but that's okay. And this is the part where you're gonna beat the tar out of it. Okay, now I've got heavily floured the board, the uh, pastry cloth, and also you roll the rolling pin into it to be sure that has some on it. Now what you're gonna do is you're going to really massage this pretty heavily. And the idea is that you wanna make layers in the dough. Now it's, it's we've, rolled and we've uh, massaged it quite a bit, gotten a lot of those aggressions out, and I'm using rolling pin on a floured board, a floured pastry cloth to roll it out. The thickness that you roll it depends on how thick you like your biscuits. My mother liked very thin biscuits, so she rolled it pretty thin, but I like a little thicker, a little more a chew to it. So I usually roll it about maybe a half an inch. And I'm using a flour cutter. And I'm just going to go around. I like to start around the edges. And the oven is preheated to 475 degrees. You need a nice hot oven for this. And you notice I said to you we were going to touch them slightly so they're going to rise up together. I'm putting them in. It takes somewhere between 12 and 15 minutes for the biscuits to, to be baked enough. Okay, the time has come and now is. And I'm gonna pull these beauties out of the oven. Oh my goodness, there is nothing as wonderful as hot cheese biscuits. As my aunt used to say, take two and butter them while they're hot. Um, but because Jonathan uh, 
went from being the macho marine broom to being a high school teacher of English after the honeymoon. I mean, immediately we went, came to Alexandria and he was teaching English. So we didn't have any money. And we lived in a fishing cottage on the river for $65 a month, which right on the Potomac. Uh, it was 500 square feet. Not near St. Luke's. Um, so we had to make do and um, I didn't go to work in those days. That wasn't always the rush thing to do, but we did get, um, um, did move uh, when we had a baby to into Holland Hall. But when he was working and we decided to go to school at night, we, uh, I discovered and um, spent most of my life making do. And it was too expensive to have child minding. I didn't have any ambitious thoughts. So while he was going to graduate school and getting degrees and then going to seminary, I was at home um, making do. And um, we had a lot of fun adventures that didn't cost anything like um, finding a farmhouse down in the Northern Neck on the water that had no, little, I mean, a de deserted farmhouse, no water, no electricity. And it was a family adventure. We had a lot of fun. So we learned to make fun and have adventures and to laugh and, and have a good time. And from the beginning, when we discovered when we had cross ideas, we'll work it out. And that sort of became our motto was- Work it out, yep. We're still working it out. And so far, so good. Find consensus somewhere. Yes, maybe that leads then into the, the question of, uh, you know, how, how did we actually find ourselves and manage to stay together? And, uh, you know, I, of course, I was quite surprised about this surprise blind date, but uh, I, I found this nice young lady very easy to talk to and not, uh, you know, not high flying, not a, snotty, snooty 
type person. And we found things in our background. We both, of course, went to school in New York State, took the same kind of state exams and other things that were somewhat, you know, similar that we got us sort of started talking easily. But uh, so I think I think we, we just very soon became comfortable with each other. Mm -hmm. Sound like you yeah. Yeah. And when he went back to the academy, he started writing letters to me every week. And as time went on, because we knew that, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. We didn't even weren't even talking about marriage or anything, but as time went on, he wrote more and more often until he was writing every day. And I wrote as often as he did. I let him be the guide of how often we were going to write. <laughs> he set the pace of that. Hi, my name is Kathy Lehner, and this is my friend Yolanda Thompson. We met about four years ago when Yolanda was the director of the Creekside Community Center and the Creekside Village Apartments on Janelee Avenue in Mount Vernon. I was an after-school volunteer. We also had an overlapping universe at Riverside Elementary School where her children were students and she was a parent volunteer and where I continued to work. Last March when the pandemic hit and the schools closed and the economy shut down, I was very worried about my students, their families, and the families I knew in the Buckman Loop area of Mount Vernon. I wasn't sure what to do, but I knew if I reached out to Yolanda, we could come up with something. And that something was a weekly distribution of school supplies. And quickly we realized parents were asking, do you have diapers? Do you have food? And so school supplies and puzzles and games turned into diapers and food and more essential things. And here almost a year later with Kathy and other volunteers in her community, and around this community, we are still distributing on a weekly basis diapers and food. And I, I didn't know how I could do this because I couldn't do this alone. But Kathy and me came up with this solution. And now weekly, I'm able to take care of these families because they are still out of jobs. They are, they're losing jobs. Some that started with jobs are losing jobs. They're getting sick with this virus. Their children are overwhelmed. This community is overwhelmed, but thanks to Kathy and other volunteers, they get a little break. They get a little peace because they know that they can take care of themselves with hygiene products, household items, diapers and food, and so much more. And we're so grateful that we have Kathy and her community taking care of us in the midst of troubling times. We're finding peace and joy and hope. But thankfully, all these months later, my friends and family are still delivering diapers to my doorstep, either via Amazon or Costco or Walmart, or just having gone shopping and, and leaving them right there on the bench for us. I don't know how much longer we're gonna be in this mess, but I'm sure glad that Yolanda and I have figured out a way to support families and provide them the dignity that they deserve. So if you can, Please support our efforts because they are much needed. And this doesn't seem to be going away anytime soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. We always laughed about the little video that Ogden Nash said. Oh yeah. So you do the first part. To keep the love light burning with love in the loving cup. Whenever you're wrong, admit it. Whenever you're right, shut up. My name is Cameron Wilds, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as one of the pastors here at Rising Hope, a United Methodist Mission Church. I came on at Rising Hope in the summer of 2020 to work alongside the Reverend Dr. Kerry Kincannon, the founding pastor of Rising Hope, who this past year celebrated 25 years of faithful service 
to the Route 1, Mount Vernon, and Fort Hunt area. Prior to coming to Rising Hope, I served a church that was, ironically, 10 minutes away from your new rector, Father Nicholas Hall. During our time together in Martinsville, Virginia, we were highly active together in ministry, and I can't wait to share in that same experience here between St. Luke's Episcopal and Rising Hope Mission Church. During the last year, COVID-19 has hit low-income communities particularly hard. As a church, we have always prided ourselves in being able to build relationships with the least, the last, the lonely, and the left out. A critical part of that relationship building is the necessity of personal contact, warm greetings, and smiling faces. As you all know, with social distancing, mask wearing, and the very real risk of passing on this virus from one person to another, we have had to change the way we interact with our community. But nevertheless, we continue to serve because we have such generous community partners who help keep us going. Community partners like you, St. Luke's Episcopal Church, and all of those persons in the Mount Vernon and Fort Hunt area who support amazing programs like the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Through the support of this fund, many communities like ours are able to experience the gift of joy through being able to provide simple acts of kindness and generosity to others. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Rising Hope was at one point providing nearly 1,500 hot lunches per week to our community. We were also serving nearly 350 families per week through our food pantry. Last month alone, through the food pantry, we served 451 families, totaling 1,414 people. With the looming threat of evictions and bills piling up for persons who have lost income or experienced a reduction of work hours, Rising Hope has also continued to be a part of the community uh, by offering emergency services and has continued to provide basic necessities for persons in our community that are experiencing homelessness. homelessness. And lastly, because of our community partners, we were able to provide during the Christmas season, 800 children with Christmas gifts this year. You see, this COVID-19 pandemic has caused stress, anxiety, and fear within our communities, especially amongst those who are the most vulnerable. But it has also shown us that as a community, we can join together to invoke positive change amongst our friends who live among us. This season has shown us that we can be resilient in the face of despair. So on behalf of Rising Hope, we say thank you to the good people of St. Luke's Episcopal Church and to all who support us and the fabulous ministry of the Coronavirus Relief Fund. I can't wait and I look forward to our continued partnership. Thank you. Hello, this is Scott Solak. I'd like to play for you one of the German composer Robert Schumann's loveliest and most tender compositions. This is called Träumerei, and it means dreaming.
Happy Valentine's Day. So we started testing out the durability of, of our, our marriage. <laughs> And, and I, I might add that, as it turns out, I, I would throw out a couple of words like fidelity and reliability and stuff like that as being uh, necessary ingredients. And uh, also uh, some degree of forbearance with uh, things the other party might do that annoyed you. So anyway, we I have no idea what he's talking about. 